everyone, and welcome to our webinar on Canada's anti-spam law. Thank you all so much for being here today with us to take the time to better understand this legislation, to make sure uh, you get your organization in compliance. As many of you know, the law takes effect on July 1st, and a lot of you who are our existing clients have been reaching out and asking us questions, primarily, you know, how do I get prepared for this? What are the tactical steps that I need to take to make sure I'm in compliance? And that's exactly what we're going to walk you through today. My name is Kim Achus. I'm Digital Marketing Strategist at Real Magnet and your host for today's webinar. Our speaker today is Real Magnet's Senior Director of Deliverability, Tom Bannerstrand. Tom joined our team in December of 2013, and he had spent over 15 years in the software development industry, including three years at iContact, where he built and managed their deliverability uh, engineering team. Um, and he came to Real Magnet after helping a marketing company build their own internal email marketing infrastructure. So he's got lots of experience and a varied perspective to share with us. So we're thrilled to both have him on our team and have him here uh, with us today on this webinar. So before I kick it over to Tom, I just want to share a few quick housekeeping notes. Um, first is for any of you who are on Twitter, we encourage you to join the conversation happening over there using ha hashtag RMCASL, R-M-C-A-S-L. And second, if you have a question, and I know for this topic there are likely to be plenty, uh, please enter it into the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and we're going to monitor them as we go throughout the webinar, and we're going to save room at the end to address your questions. And remember, with a topic as complex and complicated as this, there are no bad questions, so please just fire them away. Uh, we'll do our best to address them, and if we can't get to them, we will follow up after the webinar and answer them uh, with you directly. Uh, so, I, again, I thank you all so much for being here, and Tom, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks very much, Kim. I appreciate it. Uh, as you've all probably heard by now, Canada's new anti-spam law will go into effect on July 1st, 2014, just over two months from today. Uh, this presentation will hopefully provide you with a, a good understanding of the law and how it affects you and your company uh, and some things you can do right now to prepare for it. Uh, before we get started, I do want to emphasize that I am not an attorney and I am in no way providing legal advice of any kind here today. Uh, we encourage all of you to speak with your attorney prior to July 1st to make sure you're in compliance with CASEL. Okay, so let's uh, start off by talking about the three key differences between CAN-SPAM, that's the U.S. SPAM law that's been in effect since 2003, and CASEL, the Canadian Anti-SPAM Law. Difference number one, CASEL covers not just email, it also covers texting, push messages to social media, instant messaging, and the installation of software on people's computers as well. Uh, some of you may not be aware of this, but under can spam, a lawsuit can only be made by an internet service provider like uh, Gmail or Yahoo, places like that, which is why you haven't heard about very many lawsuits under can spam. However, Apple allows anyone who believes he has been spammed to bring suit. Obviously, there are many people out there who are very passionate about stopping spammers. Those individuals, if they're in Canada, will be allowed under CASEL to bring suit against the company or individual who they believe has sent them a spam email. So, uh, obviously, this uh, new law from Canada is much more uh, wide-ranging than can spam. And finally, uh, the key difference between can spam and CASEL is that CASEL requires a sender to obtain, obtain consent from every recipient before sending a single message. Uh, there are two types of consent a lot of the castle. One is express, and the other one is implied. Uh, and we'll cover those in detail in the next set of slides. All right. There are three things that are required when uh, you're attempting to acquire express consent from a recipient. One is that you must clearly identify the purpose or purposes for that consent. You must clearly identify the person or persons seeking the consent, and that would include any third parties that might also be sending messages. And three, uh, Castle specifies that express consent must be, quote, a positive or explicit indication of consent, end quote. Uh, an example of this would be, uh, say, on a subscription page uh, where a recipient would have to click a checkbox stating that he or she wants to receive email from you. Uh, I have a couple of examples of this coming up. Um, now, CASEL does allow express consent to be electronic, as in a web page sign-up, uh, but they also allow it to be on paper or verbal, 
but it's your responsibility as the Senate to prove that you have this consent. For verbal consent, they require a recording of the consent or confirmation by an independent third party. Uh, and for paper consent, that's valid if you have a signed form saying that they're giving you consent. All right, so uh, in this example of express consent, uh, what you're looking at is the, the final step in the process of purchasing a software application that will be downloaded. The company selling the product is asking for two types of consent to install the software and to send certain types of emails. Now, for the email consent, you'll see that this company uh, has been explicit about the types of emails that will be sent, newsletters, updates, and product promotions, and that consent will be can be withdrawn at any time. Uh, note that all of the checkboxes in this form are unchecked and that the two types of consent are separated out, each with their own checkbox. Both of these things are required for express consent to be valid. Now, in this example of express consent, and this is something you'll see all over the web right now, maybe you've got a form like this yourself on your website, uh, and there is no checkbox on the form at all. This is still considered express consent because the recipient is being made aware of what he or she is consenting to and is providing an explicit indication of consent entering an email address and clicking submit. So that is also covered by Castle. All right, implied consent. Uh, this is the second type of consent that's allowed by Castle, and um, this type of consent is pretty wide open and exists when you have a business or personal relationship with the recipient. Uh, we'll cover what that means on the next slide. Now, as an example of how wide open this type of consent is, Castle allows you to send in any email to, to any email address that's conspicuously published, say on a web page or in a law journal or even on a business card, as long as the address is not accompanied by a statement saying that the recipient does not want to receive unsolicited emails. So let's say you're a company who sends webinar promotions to people in the uh, real, real estate industry and you're looking to increase your reach. You can do a Google search for realtor websites and then look through those sites for email addresses. If you find one and there's no message there saying uh, not to send unsolicited emails to the addresses on site, you're free to add that address to your list as long as the webinar promotions you send to that address are related to real estate. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, but the most important thing to remember about implied consent is that it expires. Express consent goes on forever until the uh, recipient unsubscribes, but implied consent does expire. So with implied consent, allowed to send emails to anyone who made a purchase from you within the past two years. Uh, if you're a charity or maybe somebody running for political office, you can send to anyone who has made a donation, uh, volunteered to do work for you, or even attended a meeting with your organization within the past two years. Uh, anyone who has made an inquiry with your company within the past six months. Uh, and uh, finally, anyone who has an ongoing purchase, account, lease, contract or subscription with your company or as a member of your association. And you can even continue emailing these individuals for up to two years after the relationship ends. So as an example, if a member of your organization canceled their membership on uh, April 1st of 2014, you would be able to continue emailing her until April 1st, 2016. So this continues on from the end of that ongoing transaction that you have going with your customer. Okay. So some final notes on Castle. I want to give you uh, some, some uh, we've given you some of the basics here uh, of what you need to know about Castle and how it affects you in your organization. But uh, before I, I move on to our recommended steps to pre prepare for Castle, I'd like to give you some additional information about the law and maybe provide some perspective as well. Um, as you probably have heard, the penalties for Castle non compliance can be stiff, up to $10 million. Um, but there's still a lot of speculation in the legal field as to whether or not capital lawsuits will even hold up in the U.S. courts. Uh, in addition to that, the ability to bring suit under capital doesn't go into effect until July of 2017. So you could use that extra time to have to get express consent from your Canadian recipient. Again, I'm advising you to do that. Please seek advice of your attorney before you do anything that might potentially violate capital. Uh, but finally, the most important thing to remember, and this is mentioned not once but twice in the text of the law itself, showing you've exercised due diligence to comply with capital is a viable defense. Uh, and we consider the next seven steps I'm about to outline for you as exercising due diligence. So let's get started on that. How do you prepare for capital? So step 
Step one, try to identify the Canadian recipients in your list. Uh, there are several ways to do that. The most obvious being the physical address you have for your recipients, assuming that you have that information. Uh, if the address has a business domain, for example, google.com, you could look up the physical address of the owner of that domain at uh, whois.com, um, which in this case, obviously, Google's in Mountain View, California. The obvious flaw in this method is that everyone with a google.com email address may not work in the Mountain View office. They could be in a Canadian office of Google. I don't know if they have that or not, but they could be. Um, so you need to be careful of that. Uh, if your email sign-up page collects the geolocation data of the IP used to submit the sign-up form for your email messages, you could use that information as well, but that information is not always correct, so be careful with that too. And obviously the most accurate way of determining if an address is owned by someone in Canada is to look at the top level domain of that address. So if it ends in .ca, then you know that's a Canadian address. Now in Real Magnet, I'm about to show you here that in Real Magnet you can actually do this. You can actually collect the uh, addresses in your groups that end in .ca. So when we jump over to Real Magnet, Second here while I log in. Shouldn't have to do this. I'm not sure why I logged me out, but I'm just going real quick and find my information for logging in again. Okay. So inside the application. If you go to the Contacts tab and then click on Simple Search, click on Limit Search next to the email and text box, and go to Ends With, type in .ca, and hit Submit. If you do that, it will bring up every Canadian address that you have in all of your groups in your account. Now, at that point, you can export that list to Excel. You can create a group from those recipients, and you can save that search. In this case, I'm going to uh, add those recipients to a group. Choose the type of unsubscribe I want. Call this group Canadian recipients. And then add them to a group. All right, so now that group is created. And if I want to at this point, what I can do is, let's say I have a situation where I'm not so sure about those Canadian recipients and if I express consent from them. So what I'll want to do is, on messages that I'm going to send out in the future, I'll want to exclude those Canadian recipients from that send. So let's just say I'm sending out a newsletter. And let's grab a couple of things here. And I'm going to select the groups I do want to send it to. And down at the bottom, I'm going to click on Filter Out Groups. When I hit Submit, I'll have the opportunity to say, OK, Canadian recipients do not send to those guys. So I've just now filtered those guys out that I just put in that group of Canadian recipients. Now when I hit Submit and send this message, anybody who is a Canadian recipient who might be in any of those groups that I chose to send a message to will be filtered out from that message. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is obviously uh, if you decide you want to send a marketing campaign just to Canadian recipients, maybe to get their express consent, you can go ahead and send that one group. So uh, that's a pretty handy feature inside Real Magnet to be able to use that to grab all those Canadian recipients. Okay, so back to the presentation. Okay. So step two for preparing for Castle. Um, try to acquire express consent from all your Canadian recipients, and here are some ways to do that. Uh, the first way uh, is that we can embed an opt-in link for Canadian recipients into your email templates. So when your recipients click on the uh, Give Us Consent link that you can see there in red, they'll be brought to a page like this one. Uh, this consent landing page can be created for you by Real Magnet as well. Uh, recipients who submit this form will be tracked and then can be added to a specific group, just like I showed you before, maybe one called Canadian Recipients with Express Consent, something like that. 
Uh, and the other thing you can do is if you have a subscription management page, which I think a lot of you probably do, we can add that same link for Canadian list recipients there as well, and that will bring them to that same consent landing page. Uh, you'll want to do as many of these things as possible and any others you can think of as well in order re to retain as many of your Canadian recipients, recipients as possible. And, of course, if you're concerned about not being able to identify enough of your Canadian recipients, maybe you don't have any that are .ca, but you're sure you have some Canadian recipients in your list and you don't have email address or don't have physical addresses for them, uh, you've also got the option of being ultra-conservative and attempting to obtain express consent from all of your recipients, regardless of whether they're located in Canada, with the caveat, of course, that uh, you, know, you could lose a decent percentage of your list by doing that. Okay, preparing for Castle Step 3, uh, update your existing email sign-up forms so that the uh, recipients uh, must provide positive or explicit indication of consent. For example, checking that checkbox in the top left that's circled there in red. Once they check that and hit submit, you're good. You've got that express consent. So anybody who goes to your, your uh, sign-up pages in the future, you've got express con consent automatically when they sign up. That's in case you've got that checkbox checked right now or there is no checkbox or something like that. Step four, uh, document your implied consent and make sure you have a record of all recipients who you've obtained the express consent from. Uh, and this can be done in real magnet, for example, by adding a custom implied consent expired field for each recipient, as you can see there in yellow. Uh, and you could also track this in your own CRM database, Microsoft Excel, et cetera. Step five, implement a process for identifying an implied consent expires. You can, you can uh, suppress those addresses in Magnet now. Uh, you might also consider sending these recipients one or more times messages that attempt to acquire express consent prior to the expiration date. Step six, implement internal policies and procedures for CAFA compliance. An example would be documenting all your CAFA policies and then training all employees involved with sending email. Now, this is especially important because senior level individuals are liable for an offense if they directed, authorized, or participated in the commission of that offense in any way, even if the corporation or employee who committed the offense is not proceeded against. It's also important because having these policies in place and documenting them can really help demonstrate due diligence on the part of your organization in the event that someone does bring suit against you. And finally, step seven. Review any contracts that you have with companies who sent email on your behalf, making sure that they require these companies to comply with CASEL. You're ultimately responsible for any messages sent on your behalf, so it's important to make sure that anyone doing that type of sending for you is in CASEL compliance. And on this last slide, I've provided you with uh, some CASEL informational links, including one to uh, a Real Magnet blog article on CASEL. Uh, keep an eye out for more information on Castle as well on our website. We've got the blog coming out, and we will be posting all the slides from this presentation as well as a recording of the presentation.